And uh, good morning, everybody. It's a very special pleasure to have the opportunity today to come and address you. <coughs> uh, and first thing I want to say is, a, on behalf of the millions of children who have benefited from the political will which has allowed vaccination to be rolled out on such a wide scale across the developing world, on behalf of all of those children and the families whose lives are transformed because of the improved health outlook, on behalf of all of them, a massive thank you for all of the commitment that you've made over the last several years and a congratulations to Gavi leadership, to Seth and to the whole team who works on behalf of you to deliver that impact into the world. When you visit Africa and you go to some of the most hostile places in the world where the climate, civil war, famine all mitigates against prosperity of human life, the one thing you see repeatedly is the presence of vaccination beginning to make its impact. And that's in no small part thanks to the work of Gavi and its partners, and you should be congratulated for that. And the last time I had the opportunity to talk to a group like this was at the London Pledging Conference, a very successful event, I'm sure an event which Seth and the rest of the team look to build on over the next 12 months or so. But I thought it might be just worth reflecting on what's happened since that conference, because uh, obviously, that was an important moment where governments had to decide whether they were prepared to commit scarce resources to support the Gavi agenda, to make the commitment to increase the funding level, to believe and to support the ambition which was being laid out before them. It's been interesting over the last several years to see what's actually happened in the world. We've seen the rollout of rotavirus vaccine for the first time into the developing countries. We've seen the rollout of pneumococcal vaccine into the developing countries and also, of course, HPV vaccine into the developing countries. What's special about that is that all of those vaccines were being rolled out within just two or three years of their initial registration in any global marketplace. Now, successfully, Gavi was able to eliminate the traditional 15 or 20 year delay, which had historically meant that the poorest countries in the world had to wait almost a generation before they could benefit from the most modern technologies, particularly in the case of, of uh, pneumococcal and rotavirus vaccine, two, va two vaccines which have a specially high need among the populations in the developing countries. And that funding conference and the partnerships that had been developed around that funding conference, both before and after, are what has led to that capability. Today at GSK, we manufacture about 2 million vaccines every day. Most of them are manufactured here in Belgium and just up the road, about 20 miles in Rixen Saarten Wave, you'll see one of the world's largest, most modern vaccine manufacturing centers anywhere in the world. 2 million doses a day are made and about 80% of those doses go to the developing countries. So by far, the majority of the doses that we manufacture go to the developing countries and much of it goes through the Gavi-UNICEF partnership. How have we been able to do that? Because if any of you have ever had the chance to look at a vaccine manufacturing center, you will know that these are highly complex, very, very difficult things to envision and create. I'll give you a real example of another one of our factories which we built in Singapore. I had the pleasure of agreeing with the Singaporean government in 1999 that we would build a factory in Singapore to make our pneumococcal vaccine. But the factory was only commissioned to began to produce product for the first time in 2011 and 12. That's not because we're super slow at building factories. It's because to build factories which can make 10 antigens and combine them into one vaccine and where you can develop all of the control systems to ensure that every single dose that comes from that facility is equally high quality is an extraordinary validation and commissioning exercise. We hired the entire workforce almost two years before the first dose was produced because it took two years to train them. Those are extremely expensive exercises. In fact, that facility cost somewhere between four and 500 million US dollars. The majority of what that factory makes comes to Gavi. And it's the beneficiary of the advanced market commitment agreement which was set up beforehand. And we could never have engaged or had shareholder support to engage on such a long-term level of investment and commitment if we hadn't had a high degree of confidence that there would in fact be a marketplace. And what we would have done is we would have done what we've always done, which we would have manufactured far fewer doses, 
we would, we would have built a much smaller factory and we would have supplied Europe and America until 15 or 20 years from now, people decided it was worthwhile trying to do something to open up the opportunity for the poorest countries in the world. And the AMC is a fantastic example of how you were able to fundamentally change the way in which the private sector considered its long-term investment horizon. It's not just about the AMC. It's also about a will and a spirit from the people who run these companies. These companies are staffed by people who care deeply about the opportunity to improve human health wherever people live, whether they live in Manhattan or Malawi. It doesn't really matter. It's what can we do to really try and help those people. And that's why the dedication of the researchers that goes on into these new vaccines is so critical. A second example I'll give you is malaria. As many of you will know, at GSK, we have the world's first candidate vaccine for the prevention of malaria. In fact, if all goes well in the next few weeks, we should be able to submit the first regulatory applications in the next month or two. This is a vaccine which has the potential to perhaps reduce by around half the clinical incidence of malaria. It's not perfect, but in addition to bed nets, it's an extraordinary additional tool to reduce malarial incidence. And for all of you who've spent any time at all in an endemic region of malaria, you've seen the destruction of malaria, you've seen the way in which it fills up every hospital bed, you've seen the way in which it distracts parents, it destroys families, it undermines the economic capacity of communities. The potential for us to take another step forward beyond bed nets and to make a real impact is obvious and extraordinary. And I'm delighted that Gavi have shown significant interest in including malaria vaccine once it's gone through the regulatory and pre-qualification process at WHO and EMA. But how have we got a malaria vaccine? We've got a malaria vaccine because researchers collaborating with US CDC, Walter Reed, Researchers at GlaxoSmithKline began a program in 1982 and have stuck at that program through 2013. The company has spent $500 million and we have generated a vaccine. And we've made the promise that we will make that vaccine available at a not-for-profit price. So we've made a commitment that we will never make a profit from that vaccine. We will build whatever's necessary to make that vaccine available, but we believe the right thing to do is not to allow price to get in the way in this particular case, because it's obvious there's no compensatory market elsewhere in the world. And therefore, just like you worked on the AMC to help us come to the table on, on pneumococcal vaccine, we've recognized it's in our gift to figure out how to make the malaria vaccine available. And that's why we've committed a not-for-profit solution. Two good examples where governments and Gavi can help shape a market and where companies and their people using not just their brains but their hearts and their conscience can step forward to do the right thing. Now, as we think about the world we live in, it's extraordinarily complex. We have very rich countries who would love sometimes to pretend they're very poor. And we have very poor countries who wish they were rich but are obvious to everybody are struggling. And we have those in the middle who some days like to be rich and some days like to be poor. And we all have to navigate that. And we all know that around the table, we're all prepared to see two sides of a coin on the day it suits us to look at the two sides of the coin. The question is, how do we navigate to try and deliver a sustainable environment where we get good access, sustainable access, to people all over the world for technologies that can make tremendous difference. And it's difficult to imagine a technology more cost effective than vaccination in terms of its downstream health benefit. How do we sustain that access while still producing sufficient innovation for private companies and actually government institutes and universities to dedicate their scarce resources to look for the next innovation and the next improvement? How do we balance innovation and access? And that's a challenge for all of us. Now, the focus of that challenge, of course, inevitably lands on the owners of the product and the factories, because it's easy to fixate the perspective there. It's a simple headline or equation. But the reality is we all own this problem. 
World healthcare is controlled by governments. In many countries, governments are the single buyer and single decision maker. And in all governments, they are the single regulator. But governments can't pretend to be absent from this problem. They are a key player in this problem. And therefore, we have to try and work together to solve for that. There are two areas where we believe there are real merits for us to continue to probe and be ambitious. The first, of course, is working with partners like Gabby. Working with partners like Gabby to continue to look for ideas like AMC, to look for more opportunities like AMC, where we can deliver a very significant, tremendously good value proposition from the supplier in return for certainty, in return for long-sightedness, in return for predictability. And countries, poor countries, benefit much more rapidly from that. The second area is tiered pricing. And the way we try and resolve this very difficult challenge of who's rich, who's middle, who's developing, is to think about tiered pricing. And we believe, and until somebody gives me a better idea, we believe countries which are demonstrably richer, have higher GNI per capita, ought to contribute more to the research agenda of the world, and those which are poorer should contribute less. Those that are very poor should contribute nothing. Those in the middle should start to pick up their responsibilities. Because if those in the middle try to free ride on those at the very bottom, then inevitably there will be a reduction in total resources available for long-term development. And it's fantastic that Gavi has access to 11 vaccines now and is interested in the future in vaccines like malaria. But don't we want a vaccine for tuberculosis as well that actually works? Don't we want to look for the next thing? And if we want to look for the next thing, we have to sustain and balance the challenge of innovation and access. And tiered pricing is a sustainable way to do that. There is a very legitimate argument to be had, and we welcome it, and we know we won't always win it, to say what should the absolute level of those prices be. But we believe very passionately that we have not seen a better way to try and manage this very difficult dynamic than the principle of the richer should pay more than the middle, and the middle should pay more than the poorest. And you'll see at, G at GSK, we're very transparent about how we set those tiers. We do believe, though, as I've said already, that the poorest countries should absolutely get the lowest prices. And if you look within our tiered approach, Gavi always gets the lowest prices from GSK. And we look consistently to try and figure out ways to reduce that. As a real example with our malaria vaccine, I've always already said to you that we're committed to a not-for-profit price. But that does not stop us from looking at how we can reduce by cents, maybe tens of cents, the cost of every single dose that we make. Because we know that that creates real opportunity and oxygen for you to be able to vaccinate more people. Maybe not with the malaria vaccine, but maybe with the rotavirus vaccine, or maybe to help finally resolve the polio challenge. So we continue to look for those opportunities to reduce cost, and I certainly promise you we will continue to do that. There's another area where I believe we can make a real contribution, and just as we've led our industry in working with you on things like AMC, where we've led the industry on transparent tiered pricing, where we've led the industry on committing enormous resources to support the Gavi agenda. As I've said, 80% of everything we make goes to the developing countries. I think there's an area where we can, again, do something which I hope other companies will follow. And this really speaks to a particularly challenging issue, which is the product of your success. Because we've been able to successfully, together, deliver improved health outcome into a whole range of Gavi countries. And partly because of that improved health status, those countries are beginning to see improved economic growth. They fall into a conundrum of success makes them no longer eligible for the Gavi benefits, the graduating countries. My understanding is over the next year, probably the best news in the world right now, is that there may be 17 countries that could qualify for graduation. That has to be the most extraordinarily positive piece of news around. But for those countries, they're probably sat there thinking, 
but now I have to pay much more for my vaccines because now I'm no longer qualifying for the Gavi benefit structure in quite the way I used to. So what I'm very happy to do this morning, and I hope all of my competitor companies do exactly the same, uh, is to commit that at GSK, any country that graduates from Gavi because of the growth in their economic activity will benefit from the Gavi price that GSK offers for at least five years after their graduation. So what that means is that for those 17 countries, as they graduate out of the Gavi structure, there will be no change in the cost. So we will not start to, if you will, move them up the tier of tiered pricing, although logically we ought to. Why? Because we don't want to create a step. We don't want to create a strange dynamic where the success of economic growth for the sake of pennies and cents and dollars trips people into making resource allocation decisions which disrupt the very positive commitment that they've already made to vaccination. And we think that's the right approach. Now, I'm saying today, at least five years, I'm perfectly willing to come back and revisit that commitment as whether it should be longer once we get more experience. So I'm not saying five years and then finished. What I'm saying is we should have a joined commitment, not just to help people when they're on their knees, but to continue to help them as they start to stand up and walk forward. And we shouldn't prescribe how long that support lasts. We should instead make our decisions based on how well people walk and how well the progress is made. And I'm very happy to commit to what I believe is then a very pragmatic way of thinking about how long we should give those sorts of support. So from a GSK point of view, you have our complete commitment in terms of our willingness to take extraordinarily long-term investment decisions to support the Gavi agenda. You have our commitment that we will continue to prioritize our efforts to support the developing country health agenda. That that will manifest itself in both our investments, our customized approach to how we think we can help vaccine by vaccine. Pneumococcal disease is different to malaria, so it's a different approach. Our absolutely com strong commitment until somebody shows us a better solution to tiered pricing. And our willingness to stand by the success stories of countries that graduate Gavi so that under no circumstance can the price dynamic of vaccines be seen as a problem which arrives because of the success. And I hope you will see from those few examples, combined with the scale of 2 million vaccines a day, the very extraordinary level of commitment we have towards Gabby. We wish you well in the next 12 months of how you, in what remains a very tough economic environment worldwide, you're able to persuade governments to continue to support you. I hope very much that governments recognize the extraordinary value that the Gavi initiative creates. I hope that the governments are able to translate for their home populations the value of what vaccination can do for societies worldwide and how that can help all of us in the world, not simply the mothers and the children and the fathers in the villages of Africa and other developing countries. Thank you very much.